Under Plum Lake by Lionel Davidson, Part 4, Dream Journeys, 28, The Book of Dreams. Quietly now, I've got to keep my mind quiet. I don't want to write the next bit. I don't even want to think it. They thought I was crazy. I thought I was too. My father didn't question me much. They got him back from town when I was missing. He hardly questioned me at all. They were very careful with me. They said I was delirious for days. I'd been yelling in my sleep and sometimes, even when I wasn't asleep. After a couple of weeks, we went back to town, but they didn't, still didn't question me. They just kept watching me. And at the end of term, I went to the doctor. Nobody knew what was the matter with me. I couldn't concentrate on anything. I kept looking out of the window. I had a feeling I'd lost something. I couldn't think what it was, but I couldn't think of anything else either. The doctors couldn't find anything wrong with me. The doctor couldn't find anything wrong with me, but he said I had to have some special tests. I had the test and my mother took me back to him and he asked when I'd broken my shoulder. My mother said I'd never broken it. He was looking at an x-ray and he said I had. He said it was a beautiful job of resetting, so well healed that it must have been done years ago. So maybe I'd done it as a baby and she'd forgotten. My mother was so angry at the idea of her forgetting that he just laughed and said maybe they'd sent the wrong x-ray. But then he asked another thing. He asked why kites reminded me of death. I saw he got my papers on his desk. They asked me questions during the tests, and I'd had to say the first thing I could think of. I told him I didn't know. He read a bit more, and then he looked up again and asked why darkness should remind me of an iceberg. I said I didn't know that either. He brooded a while and said he thought I'd better see one more specialist. This specialist was a woman, and she scared the wits out of me. I knew she'd heard about my being stuck in the cave and my answers about kites and icebergs were right there on her desk, but she never mentioned any of them. She did it, she did it a tricky way of her own. She talked about being locked in cupboards and about an air accident that there'd been a plane had blown up over the Arctic, killing everyone in it, and if I'd read anything about it. I said I'd read a bit. She asked, me, she asked if I dreamed. I started saying no, but my mother said yes. She said I'd been yelling in my dreams. The specialist asked if I remembered them, and I said nothing. She said the way to remember dreams was to keep a notebook and write them down first thing in the morning. She said you had to do it fast because they faded fast, and would I do that for her? I said I would, but I knew I wouldn't. I saw right away she thought I was crazy, so I wasn't going to give her the proof. I thought I'd keep the dreams to myself. The notebook seemed a good idea, though, so I kept one. I kept one till I found my mother was reading it, and then I kept two. I kept one for my mother by the bedside and one for me under the pillow. I had a problem working out dreams for my mother. I ran out of old ones and started writing whatever I could think of. She didn't notice the difference. And when we went back to the specialist, she didn't notice it either. But from the dreams I'd made up, she got an idea which was useful. She got the idea that I was, she got the idea I was jealous of Annie. The first thing that happened was that Annie got put to bed early. She was being a colossal pest just then, and she kicked up a row for days, but it didn't help her. They kept putting her to bed early, and the specialist's idea kept on being useful. Annie knew about my dreams, and she used to come in my room early to see if I'd had one. She caught me once with the notebook under the pillow. She didn't get the point of it, but it worried me, so I started being jealous. I yelled that they let her do anything, and they let her come barging into my room, and that they thought more of her than they did of me. That stopped her coming in, and Annie didn't know why. She'd always come in my room. She couldn't understand why everybody had started pick why everyone had started picking on her, and all that happened was that she got jealous of me. I was sorry about it, but I couldn't bother with her. I was too bothered with my dreams. I was having fantastic dreams. I was having more and more of them. The one she'd caught me with was important. I'd had it in the middle of the night. I'd woken up sweating, so I knew I'd dreamed. I reached for the notebook without wanting to put the light on. I just wrote it in the dark and put the notebook back and went to sleep again. I had another in the morning, and I was just adding it when she caught me. The first dream was a problem. I could hardly read it. The writing slanted everywhere on the page. The words seemed to be racing down Mount Julia, down Mount Julius. Window went, went over the side. The second one read, sitting in a car and it starts stretching all around me. I could just remember that. I thought I'd had it before. I had a strange memory of being in something that started changing into something else. 
There was something familiar and dreamlike about it. Mount Julius was familiar, too. I thought I must have read it somewhere. I couldn't understand the window that went over the side. I wasn't even sure it was window. The W's were badly written. It could be Dindor, or Dindo, or even Dido. The only clear letters were the I and D, and were the I, the D, and the O. I didn't bother with it, but I thought about, about Mount Julius. I thought about it all morning. I looked it up during lunch in a school library. I found a Mount Julia in Switzerland, and a Mount Jolgiski in Yugoslavia. There was a Mount Julius in Alaska and some other places, but there was no Mount Julius. I didn't know what to make of it. I knew I hadn't invented it. I couldn't understand it. Just then, I was having a bad time anyway. I thought any day now the doctors would prove I was crazy, so I was trying to prove I wasn't. I was living two lives. At school, I was acting normal, doing the best I could. I stopped looking out the window. I did all my homework. The rest of the time, I was thinking. I'd pretend to read a book or watch television, but I was thinking. I'd had a fantastic idea. I had the idea the dreams weren't separate dreams. I thought they were one big dream, but night after night, I was having bits of it. Some of the bits were even repeating themselves. I'd be dreaming, and I'd know exactly what was coming. And that wasn't all. I knew the trouble had started in the cave, but I could hardly remember it. There was nothing I'd done that I could properly recall. It was just a blur in my mind. Yet I'd been stuck there for days. I wondered what I could have done all that time. I wondered if I'd hurt myself there, if I'd knocked myself out and had the dreams while I was unconscious. And this was why I remembered the dreams but not the cave. I couldn't believe that. It seemed ridiculous. Anyway, I remembered the first dream I'd had, the one about flying in a purple sky. It had struck me as strange when I had it. I knew I'd never had it before. I'd had it afterwards. I'd kept having it afterwards. So I'd had the dreams after the cave, not in it, and not before, yet they obviously came from something that had happened while I was there. I worried at it. I worked all, all I'd done. I worked out all I'd done before the cave. I remembered taking the flashlight and going out the window. I remembered finding the rabbit hole in the tunnel and going down the cliff and jumping off the step and taking off my, and taking my clothes off. I couldn't think why I'd taken them off. I just knew I had done. The strange thing was I couldn't remember putting them on again. I thought about that. I went over it again and again. I wondered when I'd put them on again. I had an idea that if I worried enough, I'd maybe dream it, and I did. We were into the spring term. I woke up one night and knew I'd dreamed and that I could remember it easily. I didn't even bother reaching for the notebook. I just lay there in the dark and thought of it. I remember jumping in the cave and seeing the hole in the floor with a chain attached to the rungs. I'd had a feeling I had to try the chain. I did it and found I had to take my shoes and socks off. I took everything off. I took off my watch and my wind cheater and pullover and the rest and wedged the flashlight near the hole. And just then a light shone back at me. A kid came out of the hole. He had nothing on. I said, who's there? He said, who's there? I said, how did you get there? He said, how did you get there? It went on. It just kept going on in the dark. We went in a flooded tunnel. It was emerald green in the tunnel. I saw my hands big and pink in front of me. I saw a barrel and a box, both painted with tar, suspended and bobbing from the, from a ch from the chain. We ducked under them. We went out to the sea, and a canoe was there, and we swam to it. It was a little canoe, six or seven feet. All around, the breeze was wrinkling the water. He said, come and dry off, and went to the end of the boat, and I followed. We went down steps, and he opened a door. It was a room about 30 feet long. There was a carpet on the floor and a sofa all along one wall. There were easy chairs and a low table, and music was softly playing. In my own room now, I was scarcely breathing. I was afraid the dream would, would vanish. But even then, with a mixture that was half fright and half relief, I felt something else. I felt I hadn't dreamed. I felt I'd remembered. I felt it had happened. Could it have happened? And that's the end of the 28th section.